Interestingly, there's a movement within the sciences at the moment away from materialism. Um, materialism is inadequate as a theory, at least, of human minds. And within consciousness studies and philosophy of mind, there's been a move in the last few years, accelerating in intensity, towards the philosophy of panpsychism, which is the idea that there's, uh, there's mind or some kind of mind or psyche, even in electrons and atoms, in the sun, in the stars, in galaxies, in Gaia, the Earth. Um, the course on which I'm teaching at the moment in Schumacher College is called Mind in Nature. And until recently, Schumacher College was one of the very few places where you could discuss this. This is now becoming mainstream. Panpsychism, um, the, the, the top American philosopher of mind, Thomas Nagel, came out in favor of panpsychism a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the most hard-nosed neuroscientists, Christoph Koch, came out in favor of panpsychism six months ago in the Scientific American. There's now a kind of stampede towards panpsychism because old-style materialism is becoming less and less credible. Um, it's, it's falling apart in, in almost every respect, as I show in my book, The Science Delusion. So panpsychism is now increasingly mainstream. It's mainstream in Dartington. Um, and, uh, and as usual, Dartington leads the way. Uh, it's catching on elsewhere as well. So that means we have a universe in which there can be stars might be conscious, the galaxy as a whole might have a mind, it might think, it might have intentions, plans, purposes. Our minds are within the mind of the sun, within the mind of the galaxy, and within the mind of the entire cosmos from a panpsychic point of view. Well, this is not a strange thought in theological traditions. In the Middle Ages, they had a panpsychist philosophy of nature. Nature was alive, the earth was Mother Earth, animals and plants had souls, and that's why they're called animals, it means beings with souls. Um, in the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, it was a panpsychist world we lived in. And God the, was the God of a living world. God was the God of a living world. It wasn't that God was the God of a machine world that was totally devoid of meaning. Panpsychism and theology are perfectly compatible and always have been. You can have panpsychism without theology. You could have a more pantheistic view, uh, but you can have it with theology as well. The theology that I like most is a school of thought called panentheism. Uh, which is God in nature and nature in God. Um, there's also a school of theology called process theology, uh, which is based on the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead, uh, which is about uh, the evolutionary nature of God, God in an evolutionary world. Traditional theology didn't have evolution. Modern theology does. Well, these are rather abstract ideas, and... Um, they're not to everyone's taste. I happen to like this kind of thing. I think about these things, and I find them helpful in my scientific work as well. Um, because the nature of the mind, even our ordinary minds, is one of the ultimate mysteries. And um, it's not going to be explained just in terms of nerve impulses. We have to have a way of understanding the bigger picture. But a return to the spiritual is going on in all sorts of ways, and I thought I'd just mention one practical way in which this is happening, which is through pilgrimage. Pilgrimage was banished in the Protestant Reformation. Uh, here in England, King Henry VIII sent the army to stop people going on pilgrimage to Canterbury. Uh, the shrine of the Black Madonna of Walsingham in Norfolk was destroyed and pillaged at the Reformation. The image of the Black Madonna was burned in a public bonfire. The suppression of pilgrimage in England uh, stopped people going on these sacred journeys, which are found in every culture, Native Americans, Australian Aborigines, you know, in the Catholic world, of course, they still exist, Santiago de Compostela being the best known. Uh, Muslims go to Mecca. Um, pilgrimage is a deep human urge. It's part of human nature. It's, I think, part of our migratory nature, our hunter-gatherer ancestors had to move from place to place in search of pastures and food, and had annual cycles of movement. Um, many animals have migration patterns. Um, so I think pilgrimage has deep biological roots, it's deep in our nature. But when it was suppressed in England and in other Protestant countries, 
um, it, the urge didn't go away. Uh, within a, a century or two, the British had invented secularized pilgrimage, which had been rebranded as tourism. And tourists, of course, still go to the great sacred places. They go to the cathedrals, the pyramids, Stonehenge, etc. But when they get there, they have to pretend they're Enlightenment intellectuals who are basically interested in art history. They're not really interested in art history at all, most of them. But they get pamphlets with facts and figures that they don't bother assimilating. Uh, because they're meant to pretend they're above getting down on their knees and saying a prayer or lighting a candle. Uh, they've risen above all that. They're Enlightenment intellectuals. That's what most educated people are supposed to be. Um, but this actually it leads to an impoverished experience. And there's been a revival of pilgrimage in many forms. The Church of England restored pilgrimages to Walsingham in, in the 20th century. There's a big revival within the Protestant churches. And there's been a revival of people going on traditional pilgrimages like Santiago to Compostela. Many people who go on that are not Roman Catholics, but um, they really appreciate the sacred journey, the journey to a goal or a destination. And I mention this because a recent initiative has just been started here in Britain in the form of the British Pilgrimage Trust. One of the people who runs it is my colleague, Dr. Guy Hayward, who's with us this evening, who's been doing this experiment. Um, and Guy and uh, uh, his friend, um, Ed, have been uh, walking, um, Will or Ed? Will. Will, sorry. Um, Ed's the other one in their team. Um, have been walking across ancient routes from, Pilgrim, from Winchester to Canterbury over the North Downs and then over the South Downs and singing songs as they go. Guy's a great singer. He was a choral scholar at Trinity College, Cambridge. And so is his friend, Will. Um, and they've, they've found when they go and sing these songs in, in, at old churches and by sacred springs, people get curious, they get invited to go for dinner with people, and they, they go and uh, they've been sleeping in some of these churches. And of course, pilgrimage uh, is something that Satish Kumar has been emphasizing here in Dartington for a very long time. Um, and he's, in a sense, pioneered a, a kind of non-denominational pilgrimage here in Britain. But Guy and Will and, and, and the British Pilgrimage Trust, of which I happen to be the patron, um, is now trying to restore uh, many of our ancient pilgrimages here in Britain. And it really works. Um, recently, a few months ago in the summer, um, I had uh, the problem of what to do for my 14-year-old godson's birthday present. I had this 14-year-old, very sophisticated godson who, who's being brought up in a very sophisticated way. Um, and I had to think of what to give him for his 14th birthday. And I, I didn't want to give him stuff. I don't give stuff to children or grown-ups anymore. I try to give experiences. Most people have got too much stuff. So I, for my great nephews and nieces, I put money into their experience fund every year, which they can use for horse riding lessons, football matches, or whatever. Um, Anyway, I thought an experience, and Guy had just done one of his pilgrimages, so that gave me the idea. So I said to him, my godson, um, for your birthday present, I offer you a pilgrimage to Canterbury. So it was a day, we take the train from St Pancras, we go to a small village about seven miles from Canterbury, get off at that station, walk so the last seven miles of the pilgrimage route through orchards, fields, woods, Bigbury Hill, where Julius Caesar fought his first battle in Britain and then past a sacred spring in the Black Prince as well, down into Canterbury. And um, I didn't know whether he'd accept this or not as a present, but he loved the idea, and we did this pilgrimage. It was the most wonderful day. We had a, pil a picnic on Bigbury Hill. We got into Canterbury. He was beginning to flag by then. I assumed that 14-year-olds could walk 8 or 10 miles with no problem, but I, I, it, he wasn't used to walking that far. Um, anyway, when he'd been revived by tea, um, we went to call even song and we went and lit candles and said prayers in the cathedral. It was the most wonderful day. And um, so I know that this can be a, a completely different way of experiencing a walk in the countryside. I love going for walks anyway, but this gives this other dimension. Now, in terms of the call, that what lies behind all religious traditions, all religions are man-made in the sense that 
Um, they, they're shaped by human culture, human language, human words, human history, human traditions. Um, but what lies at the core of them all is a sense of direct conscious connection with the source of consciousness in the universe. And um, this could be called mystical experience, and it can come in many ways. Some people uh, reach it through spontaneous experiences in nature, some people through prayer and meditation, some people through psychedelics, um, uh, some people through taking part in liturgies and services. There's many ways in which people uh, reach this. One of the interesting things that's emerged in, in, in the last few decades is the discovery that this is actually very common. Many people have mystical experiences, but in our society they don't talk about them because they're afraid of being thought weird, schizophrenic, or something like that. The Oxford zoologist, Sir Alistair Hardy, um, started at something called the Religious Experience Research Unit in Oxford. Um, and it, what he did there was to treat it this as a natural phenomenon. What in, if you're a naturalist, you look into the natural history. He did surveys of mystical experience in Britain and found many, many people had had them, including many children. And uh, they classified them, they did a kind of taxonomy of mystical experiences. Now, I don't know how common they are here, but I'd like to do a little poll of, of you, if you don't mind. Um, and the definition would be, uh, he used the definition of being a sense of a presence greater than themselves, a kind of conscious presence greater than themselves. It could be through being in nature and feeling a sense of part of something greater than yourself. It could be through a near-death experience. It could be through a psychedelic experience. Um, now, people are shy about this, so I'm going to ask you first to close your eyes now, and then, if you've had such an experience, to raise your hands. Well, thank you. I think I can reveal it's about 95%. Um, now, <clears throat> that's very interesting. I mean, I, I think these things are far more common. It may be that people who live in or near Totnes are going to be more prone to this uh, than, than a random sample of the population. Um, but um, this, uh, this is very, very interesting, you see, because I think this is what all religions come from, the sense of a connection with a consciousness greater than our own. And there could be many levels of consciousness greater than our own. The Earth, the, the Sun, the solar system, the galaxy, the galactic cluster, the whole universe, the, the soul or the field of the whole universe, the, uh, the, uh, uh, then the ultimate consciousness of God, which may permeate all these. Now, all religions put this into their own language, in their own form, through their own tradition, but they all start from experiences of this connection in the Jewish prophets and Jesus, the uh, Muhammad with his inspirational experiences, um, the Hindu gurus and their lineages of gurus, the Buddha and his enlightenment. This is how religions start, through these experiences. Then they're interpreted in human language, they're turned into more regular, uh, routinized forms of practice. Um, but Although religions have their faults and, and they're all uh, man-made or human interpretations of these experiences, personally, I still think they're very helpful. There are many people today who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. In America, it's now something like 30% of the population. Um, and I imagine there are plenty of people here who would describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. I would describe myself as spiritual and religious. It's not either or. There may be people who are religious and not spiritual, and maybe people who are spiritual and not religious, but it's perfectly possible to be both. And personally, I think that being both is, is, um, is better, because spiritual but not religious means it's very much an individual quest for most people. Um, you, you have these experiences, it's a private practice, um, but the religious uh, um, dimension makes this part of a communal activity where you can share it with other people. It links it into a tradition, it links it into sacred places, it links it into festivals and, and pilgrimages. Um, and in these areas, we need all the help we can get. And I think that uh, these traditions can really help. Sometimes they can be toxic, sometimes they can be damaging to people. But, uh, and I think that was much more so in the past than it is today. Uh, the great majority of children today are brought up with no religion whatever. They don't have 
the religion thrust down their throats. Uh, uh, they know nothing about their own tradition or any other tradition, usually, apart from a smattering of things they've been told at school. Um, so my own view is that if one's spiritual and, and is looking for a religious path, it's better to go with one's own roots, in my case, Christian. I don't seek to persuade people who are Hindus or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists to become Christian. I think it's much better that they remain Jews or Muslims or Buddhists or whatever. And for some people, it's necessary to go to other traditions to learn from them. And I've learned a great deal myself from the Hindu tradition, the Sufi tradition, and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. My wife is a practitioner of Dzogchen Buddhism, so I hear I know a lot about that through her, and I go on retreats with her. So I think we can learn from these traditions, but it makes most sense to me to be rooted in my own. And so I think that's something that... Uh, one of the thoughts I'd like to leave with you is, is, is that to just, if this isn't something you already do, to consider that possibility. And nowadays, for those who come from Christian backgrounds, it's got much easier because churches have moved with the times and um, it's not usually based on dogma or trying to make you feel guilty. Or, I've never heard a sermon on hellfire or fear of hellfire in, anywhere in the Church of England, despite going to church every Sunday for years. Um, here in Totnes, for example, at St. John's Church on Sunday between 4 and 6, they have a labyrinth, the Chartres Labyrinth, surrounded by candles, and it's called Sacred Space. You don't have to be a Christian to do it, anyone can do it. And what it is is an exploration of a sacred journey in sacred space by candlelight. Because Tuesday, Monday is Candle Mass, it's one of the great festivals, the cross quarter days. We, the great festivals of the year at the solstices and equinoxes or close to them. And then the ones in between are called cross-quarter days in the ancient pre-Christian calendar. Candlemas, February the 2nd, May Day. Um, um, then um, Lammas in August, August the 2nd. And then Halloween, All Saints, All Souls, um, November the 1st and the 2nd. It's this cycle of festivals through the year. And Candle Mass is one, a festival of light with candles. In Totnes, you can walk the labyrinth in a sacred place um, by candlelight for free. So there's a great wealth offered to us. Um, that There are many offerings free and open to all. And I feel that it's um, worth at least considering um, taking up what's offered to us so freely and so generously. And I think really there's plenty wrong with all religions, there's plenty wrong with all national customs and all human institutions, but I think in this case what one has to do, in most cases, is to try and find the best in them, and then it's obviously going to be more helpful and uplifting than looking for the worst. Well, those are the thoughts I wanted to leave you with, and um, um, now if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them. <coughs>